Saturday University is sponsored by University of Wyoming, the University of Wyoming Foundation, the Wyoming Humanities Council, and UW Outreach School. The program is presented locally by Sheridan College. It is my pleasure right now to introduce Rachel Saylor, who's a professor of art history in the University of Wyoming Art Department. She hails initially from Cannon Falls, Minnesota. She got her BA, MA, and PhD all in art history. She um, did her bachelor's at Oregon State University. She was in Eugene at the University of Oregon for her master's and did her PhD at the University of Iowa. And she received that PhD in 2007 and came to, U to Wyoming, to the university in 2011. Rachel's research is on 19th century and early 20th century photography in the American West. Um, she excavates history via looking at photographs. Her book on the subject is called Meaningful Places, 19th Century Photographers of the American West. It's published by the University of New Mexico Press. It's literally hot off the presses because Rachel told me that she got her own co first copy of the book just two or three days ago. So um, it is, we are literally at the cutting edge here as we listen to Rachel Saylor talking meaningful places, looking at 19th century photographs of the American West. Please welcome Rachel. Thank you. Um, thank you all for having me. So I'm going to talk about my, my latest research project, the one I've just completed. That's the picture of the book cover. So uh, I'm going to talk about 19th century Western photography, but as Peter said, I am an art historian. Um, and the type of photographs that I'm going to show you today are not technically considered art in my field. Um, so I try to have a lot of conversations with people that don't really work. Um, but when I came to art history, I knew I wanted to study landscape, and I knew I wanted to study landscape in the West. And of course, I came via this route. Um, when people think about Western landscape art, this is what you think about, and rightly so. Um, these paintings by Moran are, are spectacular. Um, when I was looking at Western painting and thinking about landscape, I was also running into uh, photographs of those same places. So I started to think, well, those are really interesting. I was a little bit more drawn to those kinds of photographs than um, to the more sumptuous landscape paintings. Um, so I, I started investigating uh, the, the kind of photographs that William Henry Jackson did. Um, I looked into Carlton Watkins and Timothy O'Sullivan, and I thought they were fantastic. There's a handful of Western photographers who are pretty famous. Um, if you live in the West, it's likely that you've heard of Carlton Watkins or William Henry Jackson or Timothy O'Sullivan. Um, and further still, I was running into Western landscape photographs that looked like this. And this really caught my attention. I found that I didn't want to talk anymore about painting. I wanted to talk about these funny little photographs that I was finding. And the more I investigated, the more I found that these photographs are everywhere. Not this exact kind of goofy photograph, but uh, landscape photographs from the 19th century are everywhere in the American West. And so I looked into it a little bit more because the, photo, the photo, photographers that I was looking at were not famous. People have never heard of them. Unless you visit historical societies, unless you visit um, archives and special collections at universities. Um, and then I started to do a little bit of work in the library and I found out that there was a lot of text being written about these photographers. Um, and there were encyclopedias, there were books of biographies, um, there were individual books being produced in different states across the West. And what I found out was that these um, scholars and these authors were not necessarily um, looking across the West, they were looking at their own hometown or their own home region. So, um, for example, Evelyn Cameron is a photographer from Montana, and the people in Montana were really interested in Evelyn, Mon in Evelyn Cameron. Um, Solomon Butcher was from Nebraska, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about him. People in Nebraska were interested in him. But outside of those locations, there was no conversation about what it all meant. 
And what I found out was that not only were there many of these local photographers, there were thousands of them in the 19th century. Photography and um, the Euro-American immigration west went hand in hand. So um, photography came to the United States in about 1840 um, and was right there with people as they began to move into the Western territories. And so I wanted to think about the settler photographers. And that's really what I, I ended up calling them because these were not photographers like Carlton Watkins or William Henry Jackson who were making images in the West and then sending them back to the East. Um, you know, so for example, uh, the, the handful of famous photographers would make tourist imagery, they would make imagery for the government so that they would fund surveys, um, they were being made to promote immigration. So all of these photographers would go west, they'd take a bunch of pictures, with maybe the exception of Carlton Watkins, who, who lived um, more thoroughly in the west, but they were for the most part sending all of their photographs to the east. And in my field, we call this uh, Eastern, I'm sorry, Western pictures for Eastern parlors. And that was the way that it worked. And so when I kindly, I started looking into these photographers, I thought, wait a minute, there are thousands of these photographers. And the reason that nobody knows about them is because their archives are not in the Smithsonian. They're not in the big repositories in the East because that's not where they went. These photographers made Western photographs for their own local Western audiences. And people are rightly looking to their state archives to um, unearth these photographs and investigate them, but they're doing them one at a time as if they were a unique, um, a unique individual in a unique situation. And so my whole plan was to think about them as a phenomenon. What were they all doing? Um, how were they all similar instead of what made them you know, different from everybody else who was in the West making these photographs. Now, there are a couple of reasons why the photographs that I'm going to show you were not um, studied too extensively. First of all, uh, most people assume that the vast majority of photographs being made in the West by these men, they were mostly men, were portraits. Um, and, in, and there are many, many portraits. They ran portrait studios, and that was really the bread and butter of their, of their um, studios, of their businesses. Uh, and the other reason is because of um, a, a bias towards the type of imagery that they were making that wasn't considered high art. Um, it was considered local visual culture, but even William Henry Jackson didn't really have a kind word for these photographers. He said that the, the only real kind of photograph that they made that weren't portraits were boring documents. Boring documents of somebody's barn, somebody's pigs, you know, somebody's homestead, that kind of thing. So there's been a little bit of a bias uh, to looking at these photographers and their product as, as this larger phenomenon that, in my view, was really a, a settlement tool, something that um, these photographers gave to their community because there was a demand um, to help that community uh, identify itself, to help them see themselves within a landscape that maybe, you know, through a photograph wasn't as foreign, wasn't as isolated, um, to build community through a visual culture. The other really interesting thing that I found, and this is, these are just a couple of examples, but I have many, is that the photographers in the West who set up their little studios in every little t small town and every city in the West, they were all over the place. And I know that most of you are sitting there thinking about the photographers that you know of, right? <laughs> Probably from Wyoming. Um, they considered themselves proprietors of art. Even though they were overwhelmingly entrepreneurs, some of them were trained artists, many of them weren't, but their businesses were geared towards um, photographs and art. So here, photographs and painting in this um, early ad for imagery, for visual culture from Iowa City. And here's just another example. Um, Whitney's photographic studio was in St. Paul, and I'm gonna talk about him a little bit more. Um, and if you look at the subtitles, it's 
here it says, go to Whitney's Gallery and Art Depot. So they were selling their photographs, but they were also selling paintings. They were also selling prints. And there are some cases where photographers that were very remote would get um, fine art prints personally, and they would make photographs of that print and then sell the photographs to the people in the community. So they, these Western cultures, for the most part, were not inundated with visual imagery. Um, to have a picture of something was a real treasure. Um, so that's what they were selling. So I can't study a thousand photographers. <laughs> you know, I can't study 500 photographers to make my point. It's, it's a little bit too much. So what I did was I um, decided to do some case studies. So I picked some photographers who I thought were representative um, of the era in which they worked. Um, and that was related to the photographic technology that they used and that um, also were responding to very specific um, environmental factors of, you know, from the place where they lived. So what I've done is I've started in the Daguerrean age with Thomas Easterly, um, who worked in the 1840s and 50s in St. Louis. Um, then I looked at a photographer from St. Paul who was considered to be in the far west in the 1850s and 60s, the great northwest, Minnesota was called. Um, and then I looked at the 1870s um, with a photographer from southern Oregon, and then backed up to kind of follow the pattern of immigration to a photographer in the 1880s who was working in the Great Plains, who was working in Nebraska. So I'm going to show you um, these photographs and these stories and to demonstrate how they were responding to those individual characteristics of their local community at that specific time with the technology available. But then when we add it all up, we see that they're all kind of doing the same thing. They're all trying to build community for their own personal business gain, but also as a way to, to settle the West. So I'm going to start with Thomas Easterly. Um, he was a photographer in St. Louis, and he was a daguerreotypist. Now, um, daguerreotypy was a type of photography, the very first type of photography, that did not rely on negatives. So, in other words, a daguerreotype is a <coughs> photograph that's made on a light-sensitive coated metal plate. There is no negative. So, when you make a daguerreotype like this self-portrait of Thomas Easterly, there's only one in the world. It's not reproducible. And he was taking photographs in St. Louis for mostly the people of St. Louis. Um, and that's because there was only one picture at a time and they were very um, precious. So even though St. Louis um, in the 1850s was really uh, a very bustling place, right? It was the, the gateway to the West. This is where people went to outfit and then jump on their overland journey. Um, even though people were streaming through this city, he was situated there and his clientele was primarily local. So he was making uh, daguerreotypes of images like this. It was a lake, a small lake in St. Louis called Chauteau's Pond. And what he did was he would go out into the local environment and he would take pictures of the landscape. This is a very specific place. And so the people of St. Louis enjoyed that image. It made sense to them. It, it meant something to them. Um, however, a picture like this would have also been interesting to anybody who was, who was excited about landscape views. And in the 19th century, everybody was excited about landscape views. Um, from you know, the 17th century and through the 18th century and the 19th century, there had been a lot of cultural discussion about landscape and specifically the different types of desirable landscapes um, that people enjoyed. And so this particular type of view is a demonstration of what they called the picturesque. Um, everybody knew about the picturesque. Uh, picnickers and day trippers would go into you know, the, the, um, the rural areas to find picturesque views. People would make sketches of it. People would take photographs of it. And it's a way of making a picture that heightens its charm, that heightens its, um, its kind of quaintness. 
Um, and picturesque literally means to, to look like a picture. So they would try to find landscapes, actual landscapes, that looked like it could be a picture, which seems a little backwards to me. <laughs> but um, so this is the kind of picturesque view that everybody understood, everybody was aware of. Um, it was the idea of the picturesque in the land was so pervasive. One scholar said that it was so pervasive in the 19th century that the picturesque was to be breathed in with the air. People intuitively understood it. Um, that this is what a good landscape looks like, and this is what a good picture of a landscape looked like. So Easterly was selling these kinds of views. Um, and here's just another example of Choteau's Pond. Um, there, was a, there was a call um, among his clientele for these views. And, and, and as I said, even though uh, somebody passing through may not have understood this place, they would have understood this type of picture. But Thomas Easterly was also making images like this. <laughs> um, and again, these odd pictures that, that don't conform to any kind of um, standard idea of landscape. Um, this is called the Big Mound. And it was an Indian mound that existed within the city of St. Louis. It was down on the river. Um, they began to excavate this big mound, not really for scientific reasons, although there was some anthropological reporting that went along with this. But they started to dismantle this mound, and it was huge. And if you've ever been to St. Louis, you, you probably know about Cahokia, this very big Indian mound that still exists. That one exists. This one is completely gone. Um, and the reason that they dismantled it was because, first of all, that very charming and quaint picture of Chateau's Pond is a little misleading. Um, it was actually more of a swamp. And there was a cholera epidemic <laughs> in the city of St. Louis. So they used the dirt from the big mound to fill it in. And, then they, and so they got kind of halfway. They excavated the mound halfway down. And then the railroad was coming through. They needed to lay track. So they used the earth of this mound again to create the, the railroad bed, essentially. So they needed dirt. Um, so these are views that are not what we call landscape. And yet, a person from St. Louis would have been able to look at these and say, oh, yeah, I remember. They were Indian mounds. Or oh, actually, a lot of people didn't believe that they were man-made. Um, and they would say, you know, that's the history of our city. We can see that this is associated with progress, because that's really how people mostly understood them. But a person who was passing through would not have understood these pictures at all. There would have been no context for them. So this is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm interested in. How are local people using local landscape images um, as a source for understanding community, as a source for understanding their, their identity as a new place? Now, Joel Whitney is the photographer that I looked at from St. Paul. And as I said, St. Paul was the great Northwest um, in this period, which is kind of interesting. Um, he lived in St. Paul, and when he was a young man, he went on uh, a little uh, trip, a little one of these picturesque day trips that I talked about, to go look for the picturesque waterfall that was called Minnehaha Falls. And Minnehaha Falls existed outside the city of St. Paul. So it was kind of a, a trek to get there. And so Joel Whitney, the young Joel Whitney, went with this daguerreotypist named Alexander Hessler, um, and they hiked out to find Minnehaha Falls. Today, Minnehaha Falls is in the city of Minneapolis. But at the time, Minneapolis didn't exist. But they knew it was out there. People had heard of this picturesque waterfall, and that was um, what everybody liked. So Alexander Hessler went out and made daguerreotypes. Well, this is really a story about Joel Whitney, not Alexander Hessler, because what's really fascinating about the Hessler imagery is that one of the daguerreotypes he took that day made its way back east, as they did, and found its way into the hands of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, and from this photograph, Longfellow was so inspired by looking at this picturesque view of this daguerreotype that he wrote the Song of Hiawatha. Um, so instantly, I mean, this was a, a kind of local treasure, but instantly, because of the success of that epic poem, 
um, this place, as well as the images of this place, became very, very popular. Okay, but that doesn't seem to fit what I'm talking about here today. But in fact, um, Joel Whitney then had his own studio um, through the 1860s, and he produced countless images, not just of Minnehaha Falls, but also of different picturesque views around um, that Twin Cities, Minnesota region. Um, and so this is kind of the thing that he produced. Now, everybody in the country knew about Minnehaha Falls at the time. It was in, listed in Picturesque America in the 1870s. Um, it was written about in newspapers because the poem made it famous. Mark Twain even came to see Minnehaha Falls. And so much had been written about this little waterfall that he said, these falls are celebrated enough. I don't think it needs a bump from me. And so he, you know, unusually reticent, I guess. <laughs> and, but what Joel Whitney did was he wasn't really capitalizing on this national kind of picturesque tourist uh, phenomenon. What he was doing was taking pictures of a local place, selling it to local people because people were proud of its national fame. So he kind of still was able to find this, this local clientele. Um, and so he made these carte de visite um, photographs. And you can see that there's the photograph and then there's printed quote from the Song of Hiawatha below. And so a carte de visite is basically a type of photograph that was very popular in the 1860s. It was primarily for portraiture, although, <laughs> as I said, Whitney was producing lots and lots of landscapes. And, and literally, carte de visite is a calling card. People would have images, their portrait done, and they would buy a whole bunch of them, and they would hand them out like business cards. They would visit somebody, and they would leave their carte de visite. And so people started collecting. Landscape views on a carte de visite were incredibly collectible. And it was the locals. Um, the back of one of these carte de visite is also an ad for Whitney's, and this is the one I showed you before. And you can see for the best, you go to the Art Depot, Whitney's Art Depot, for the best views of Minnehaha, St. Anthony Falls, Fort Snelling, Fountain Cave, City of St. Paul, and all of these landscape and urban views. So people were collecting images of their own city um, and surrounding countryside. They were wildly collectible. Now, the reason that these photographs were collectible was because they were cheap. And the reason that they were cheap was because they weren't daguerreotypes. Um, this is the era of wet plate collodion. Um, and essentially, it's the very first type of negative. And many of you probably know about glass plate negatives. But it was much easier, and it was much more affordable way to produce photography. It, by today's standards, it was still incredibly laborious. I mean, you had to take your glass plate, and you had all of your chemicals. And, and when you wanted to take a photograph, you would coat the glass plate with a light-sensitive sub, uh, substance, put it in your camera, expose it, and then you'd have to develop it and wash it immediately. Um, but then, once you got a good negative, you could keep making these photographs, right? It was reproducible. Um, and then, so that's what Joel Whitney counted on. He saturated St. Paul with images like this. Um, and these are picturesque tourists. And so this is, works a little bit different than what we saw with, um, with Easterly, because it's almost like the local identity is reliant on this pride of place that was created, not just because of this picturesque view, but because of that, that kind of national fame that attended it. The third photographer that I looked at was Peter Britt. And so you can see that I'm moving forward in time. Um, and with that, the technology changes and the location changes. Um, Jacksonville, Oregon is in southern Oregon, right near the California border. And uh, Peter Britt was a Swiss immigrant who was also a painter. So he was actually a full-fledged artist before he became a photographer. He went out to Jacksonville to be a miner. This was a, a pretty significant mining town. but he realized that he'd make a better living as a photographer than he would mining. So he became the local photographer. Um, and he started doing portraits just like they all did. But he also went out and took these trips into the surrounding countryside and made these views um, 
mostly wet plate negatives were being made. And he also started to experiment with dry plate technology, which is like a, a glass negative that is pre-coated. So you don't have to do the developing and do all the chemical interaction in the field. You can take it back to your studio. Um, so he was making these images as well, lots and lots of landscape imagery. And if you've ever been to Oregon, if you've ever been to Southern Oregon, you know that the landscape down there is pretty spectacular. Um, in fact, it exceeds what people considered the picturesque landscape, and it, it, it was a sublime landscape. So the Rogue River Falls here, um, Mount Shasta on the right, were both examples of a sublime landscape, but photography had a hard time capturing the sublime. And the sublime was another category of landscape, like the picturesque, that was really about um, a kind of literally an awesome kind of landscape that was awe-inspiring, that it was almost, it almost inspired, inspired fear, that it inspired deep spirituality. Um, and he couldn't really capture that with his glass plate negatives. So he tended to, and this is a really good example, he tended to kind of picturesque it up anyway. Um, so he was traveling not just around the little city of Jacksonville, and that little city is, is still there. It's a really neat little historic town. But he was making larger forays into the countryside. He was going down into California. He would take 10-day trips to go find views to bring back for the people of Jacksonville. Because Jacksonville was incredibly remote. It still kind of is remote, actually. Um, so he was bringing these views back to the people of Jacksonville who felt like it wasn't just their town and kind of the you know, five miles surrounding their town, but it was maybe 100 miles surrounding their town, that that was their territory. That was the kind of landscape that informed their identity. So Peter Britt um, is most famous for this photograph. Uh, it is the very first photograph of Crater Lake. And Crater Lake um, is about, not today when you have to take the highway, but at the time, it was about 75 miles from Jacksonville. And everybody had heard about this, this lake um, it's a really incredible, very sublime place. It's a caldera. So if you go up into the uh, volcanoes of this region, um, one of them is uh, Crater Lake. And so a caldera is a collapsed volcano that fills up with water. This is also where we get our blue-green algae. <laughs> um, so he went up there to take photographs, and it took him 10 days round trip. It was 75 miles away. Um, the weather is fierce up there, even in the summer. I think they get, you know, between 10 and 15 feet of snow every winter. It's really kind of harsh, remote, very sublime place. And so he took these photographs and he brought them back to Jacksonville, and people love them. And it's almost like, from what I can tell from, from reading the way people wrote about this place in these photographs, it's almost like the people of Jacksonville were proud to have this almost as a symbol of their efforts, the greatness of the region, um, but it was a, a community kind of oriented feeling. He wasn't selling these to people outside of his town. Um, here is a picture of his son, Emil, sitting on the rim of the caldera. Um, so immediately these were uh, not just kind of locally very important, but people started to try to make this trip themselves. And eventually, uh, Peter Britt's photograph, his very first photograph, became important for the development, it was used for the development of this place as a national park. So eventually they went on to greater fame and glory, but when he was making them, it was all for uh, Jacksonville. He was also making stereographs, and I, I just thought I'd throw this in there to remind you that this was the, uh, you know, the late 19th century was the prime era of, of stereograph and stereoscope viewing. And landscape views particularly were desirable. So again, I'm trying to bust the myth that all of these you know, kind of frontier settler type of photographs were portraits. They weren't. People were crazy about this kind of landscape um, imagery. So then, if we're going to follow the, pa uh, the pattern of settlement of Euro-American immigrants, um, after going to the far west, right, they, they came back and settled on the Great Plains, <coughs> the last area that, 
that people wanted to settle. Um, and so one of the most interesting and probably the most famous of all of the pho photographers I've, I've shown you so far was Solomon Butcher. Um, he was a homesteader who set up in the central county of Custer um, in Nebraska. He went there as a homesteader. He was really a character. He was not an artist. He was not even a photographer. Um, but he wanted to make some money and he didn't want to farm. <laughs> and people, people accused him of, of being afraid of hard work. It, he's, he's really a character. Um, and he said, I'm not afraid of hard work. I'd li lie down next to it any day. <laughs> That's very common for him. Um, so he thought, he had this, he kind of hatched this brilliant plan that he was going to become a photographer and, and drive around in his horse and buggy and take photographs of all the homesteaders in Custer County. And his idea was that he was going to produce a community album. So this falls right into my idea that this was all community oriented, community building, identity building kind of landscape work. And so here is a detail. Um, and you can see on the side, it says Butcher's picture album of Custer County. So he was literally going to make like a photo album, um, the type of photo album that you would have in your family. Um, so he drove around in his little horse and buggy and he interviewed homesteaders and he got all of their biographical information and he took their picture in front of you know, their homestead and then he was going to produce this album. Well. Well, he would sell them photographs as well of their homestead. Um, he had a lot of problems <laughs> doing this. Now, the problem with photographing at the time in this era of the picturesque in central Nebraska was that it wasn't picturesque. <laughs> now, if you've been to in central Nebraska, I'm sure you know, you know about the Great Plains. It can be incredibly sublime, but there was no pictorial method for capturing any of that. Um, so, and to be fair, I'm showing you this for a dramatic effect. This is actually a scene from the Red River up in Manitoba. So this is up by <laughs> Winnipeg, but you get the idea. How do you take a, a meaningful photograph of a landscape when it looks like this? Um, so what he did was he made sure to put his people in front of their homestead. It wasn't just the, the place, but it was the people in their place. And there was a pride of being in their place as homesteaders that's really remarkable when you consider that they were living in dugouts and sod houses exclusively. Um, by the turn of the century, people in this county were moving into wood frame houses, but for a couple of decades, they lived in these dirt houses um, that was made, they were called Nebraska bricks and they were made from from the saw, they would cut them up and stack the dirt bricks up and, and build their house. Um, so it was not easy living. And these homesteaders were out there trying to prove up their, um, their homestead, trying to make it more valuable than when they got it, right? That was the condition for, for owning a homestead. And so they were very proud of what they were doing. And they wanted to be involved in this album. They bought a subscription to get one of these community albums. Um, and the reason that it kind of didn't work out was because the, his sod house caught on fire and all of his ne uh, some of his negatives survived but all of the biographical information went away so he couldn't produce that album right away but eventually what happened um, is Solomon Butcher produced a book because the longer he waited um, it was more fortuitous for him because in the late 1880s he was able to print the photographs he had and the informational text together. And that was because of the new halftone technology that emerged. So it wasn't an album anymore, it was a photographic book. But the idea was the same. Um, he wanted to show the people of Custer County, he wanted to capture this moment that he knew, that they all knew, was changing. And that's true of all of these communities. They knew they were living in special times. They knew that they were living in an era that was soon going to go away um, as more people began, uh, began to come west. So I brought, there's the picture I started with. Um, I just thought I would show a few more of these um, just to give you a sense. You know, when I first started looking at these, I thought, what are they so proud of? But the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, they're, they're working hard. They're, they're very proud of what they are able to accomplish. And by 
the late 1880s and into the 1890s, um, things were changing dramatically. So these community photographers were really capturing the transformation of communities, um, the transformation of technology into their communities. And they were also trying to place these um, landscape experiences within a much larger continuum that connected them to the East, that connected them to European visual culture, that connected them to the history of Western visual culture. So they could take an unknown, foreign, isolating, maybe scary place, and through photography, it was made familiar. It was made um, comforting, even. <laughs> I, you could look at these all day long. They're fascinating. <laughs> now, they knew that they were part of this passing era. And um, in fact, Butcher actually went on to make a book that showed homesteads when they were first dug out inside houses, and then a comparative picture of later when they got their, their wood frame house so everybody could see that transformation. But all across the West, uh, photographers understood at the end of the century that things were changing. Um, and so marketing for their products began to change. And in fact, um, this is the best one, but I could show you lots and lots and lots of examples of this. Photographers changed from local photographer to pioneer photographer. So they started to add that word pioneer because they thought that you know, they were one of the original um, people in the community, they were looked to as a, a leader in their community, um, and they wanted to capitalize on, on that kind of authenticity of being there first. So they all kind of took this moniker of the pioneer photographer. Um, and that's really important, that idea of pioneer photographer um, that they were all aware of because at the turn of the century everything changed um, in the West and in photography itself. Now in the West it was, um, it, you know, moving about the country was just a little bit easier. It was, the West was more accessible by, by train and certainly um, by eventually automobiles. Um, and in photography things dramatically changed because of the invention of Kodak's brownie camera. Um, when the brownie handheld camera came out, you know, you might have heard this Kodak slogan, you push the button, we do the rest. When that came out, everybody had their own cameras. They could make their own photographs. So why did they need pioneer photographers in their town? So pioneer, not just pioneer photographers, photographers, professional community photographers went away, largely. Um, and so I thought, well, that can't be the end of the story. There were so many of these pioneer photographers in the West that certainly there had to have been some kind of residual um, effect. What did people do once these community photographers went away? They had, you know, millions of photographs of local landscapes, you know, saturating all of these communities. Well, what I found was that professional, would-be professional photographers in the West began to draw on the legacy of those earlier 19th century pioneer photographers um, to authenticate themselves, to make themselves seem a little bit more um, connected to the good old days, in fact. So one of the, one of the best examples I have of this are the Cole brothers, who were photographers at the Grand Canyon. Um, Emery, and Emery Kolb and his brother El Ellsworth came to the Grand Canyon about the same time as the railroad. So about 1901, the Santa Fe Railway um, provided access to the south rim of the canyon. And so they moved there and set up shop. And they lived there, um, especially Emery, for a very long time, into the 1970s. And they produced tourist imagery at first of tourists who are coming to visit the canyon. But what's interesting about this whole scenario is that they weren't, for example, providing photographs for a local community, but they were local photographers. They were Grand Canyon photographers. They didn't really travel far and wide and try to um, produce you know, imagery of the whole Southwest. They traveled a little bit, but they were local photographers, even though their clientele was not local. <coughs> 
So what I'm showing you here is a, a kind of a, a tourist memento, a souvenir that you could buy if you went to the Grand Canyon. And what I love about the Cole brothers is that they weren't so much selling the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon didn't need and doesn't need to be sold, right, as an important kind of spectacular place, but they were selling themselves and their own kind of pioneering authentic adventures at this spectacular place. And so even though this is like a kind of a souvenir album of views of the Grand Canyon, of course their, their frontispiece is of themselves doing this kind of ridiculous thing. Um, <laughs> one brother is above and the other is hanging on a rope trying to get a great view, a great photograph. It's completely staged. Um, it's just meant to look incredibly spectacular. And so um, they had their studio there for many years, right at the head of Bright Angel Tr Trail. So if you've been to the Grand Canyon, you've probably been in this studio or walked right by it. It's still there. I think it's an art gallery now. Um, but this right, right on the edge of the canyon, right at the head of this trail. And so they're, again, their kind of early bread and butter for making a living as photographers was to take tourist photographs of these pack trains that went down into the canyon, which still go, right? You can still do this and you can still have your photograph <coughs> made. Um, so there are thousands of these photographs and they're, they're really interesting images. Um, this is one of the most famous because we have here Theodore Roosevelt who, who did this. Um, but every time people did this, they would set up their camera, they'd run ahead of the pack train, set up their camera, take the photograph, take a bunch of them, run ahead, run down, Emory was very fit, run down halfway down to, to Indian Gardens where there was water, um, develop the photographs, and then run back up the trail, no kidding, he would run, um, and have photographs ready for when they came back up and he would sell them. So again, it's not exactly the type of photography that was being produced in the 19th century, but the way they understood the pioneer photographer was fundamental to their own business and their own sense of, of self as photographers. So these are just a few of the many type of images of themselves doing these heroic photographic feats. And so that was really the legacy. You know, making, tromping eight miles to make a daguerreotype, you know, going 75 miles to create images, glass plate negatives of Crater Lake, the idea of hardship and toil was not just a narrative of immigrants to the West, it was the narrative of photographers. And it was, it was something they capitalized on. So here they are kind of performing the pioneer. That's how I think of it. They're performing um, the dramatic activity that they saw as the most salient feature of 19th century landscape photography. Um, and then their most notable adventure was a, a river trip of the Colorado. They wanted to uh, redo Powell's 1869 uh, river trip down the Colorado from Green River to the Gulf of Mexico, um, or the Gulf of California, actually. And uh, they didn't want to just do the adventure, they wanted to photograph it. And they weren't just going to photograph it because then you're just producing the same photographs over and over again. They wanted to make a movie of it. So they bought, kind of illegally, a movie camera from the great Indian photographer, um, Frederick Monson, and they went on this river trip. But it's not just that they're doing this kind of pioneering, adventurous activity of running the Colorado River. Because in fact, it was staged. They, they would go down the river in their boats, but then they would stop and one brother would get out and the other brother would go by in his boat. And he would say, oh wait, I didn't get that. You know, go back and do it again. <laughs> so so there, there are these pictures. It's like the pictures of the photographer doing the photo, you know, photographing. So it's really an interesting performance of that earlier era. Go back and do it again. They would show this in their studio um, daily, and there was a narrative that Emery would read. They did a really big uh, article for National Geographic in 1914, um, and then they had, uh, they traveled a little bit to show this film and talk about their narrative, and they wrote a book. So you could buy the book, 
you could go in and see the film, right? It wasn't just buying a photograph anymore. It was the whole experience of the Western photographer's world that they were selling. Now, um, to end, um, there are a lot of photographers like the Cole brothers who were trying to combat the brownie camera. Um, they were trying to provide an experience through photography that individuals couldn't get themselves with their, their own cameras. Um, and I try to push that idea a little bit further. And so what I'm showing you here is Carlton Watkins, the great 19th century Western photographer. He's a very old man being helped out of his studio. Um, he's here in 1906 during the San Francisco earthquake of that year. And so what I want to leave you with is really um, something to contemplate and something I talk a lot more about in my book, but something to contemplate that those great 19th century photographers literally overlapped with some of the most important 20th century photographers that we still know today. So my point here is that in 1906, during the San Francisco earthquake, across the bay was a young four-year-old Ansel Adams, who was also experiencing that place and that time um, as a little boy. And so I would ask you to consider Ansel Adams' photography as being incredibly reliant on that 19th century legacy of photography that I've been talking about, not just Carlton Watkins, but these, that, that kind of small army of photographers who provided identity in the West. Um, people don't talk about him that way because he was overtly an art photographer. He was a modernist. But if you look, and I've done this, if you look at his writings and you go back and kind of look at some of the exhibitions that he put on, he was very much aware of those earlier photographers and his role in following in their footsteps. So thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Do you see color photography moving at all in this tradition somehow, or how would you bridge that? Well, I, I think personally that photography still responds to that 19th century narrative of the, the settler pioneer photographer. Um, and there was actually a great exhibition at the uh, Eamon Carter in Texas recently that talked about early color photography. Um, I think that color photography and even contemporary photography is still a response. So when you get into the later half of the 20th century, um, there are people like, um, Adams, the other Adams, not the Ansel Adams, who was doing uh, landscape Western photography that wasn't picturesque and that wasn't grandiose and beautiful as a way to counter that kind of earlier tradition. So, I mean, I don't look at a lot of color photography, but as a modern invention, um, it's definitely part of this tradition. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting looking at it, the technology advances from difference. Yeah. Um, how it always seems to threaten the professional photographer, and that's one of the big issues right now with digital photography. Yeah. And it, and it just mirrors itself as it goes through time. It really does. Then the whole uh, photographic profession has to change with it to mm -hmm. adapt to the new technology. And um, Thomas Easterly, the daguerreotypist I started with, he, when wet plate collodion came around, and it was immediately successful, he w refused to do it. <laughs> and he kind of, at the end of his career, in the end of his life, he was struggling as a photographer because he was not going to, he was a Daguerrean artist and he was not going to give it up. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening. Um, in fact, I had a conversation not that long ago with uh, the photo historian at the Eastman House in Rochester. And they, he was telling me how the Eastman Kodak Company is shutting down all their paper facilities, they're not producing photographic paper anymore. Um, all of their equipment, you know, they're, they're just closing it all down. And he is personally panicking um, because he feels like something's going to be lost. But um, all of the technologies that we see that I've shown you today are still being employed. So there's a resurgence in daguerreotypy as an art form and wet plate collodion. So, that's the good news, is that somebody somewhere will want to do those, you know, obsolete technologies.
I think it's interesting that when you were talking about the homestead pictures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how that created pride in the community. Yeah. And those people were proud. Where in today's Western history textbooks, they're used to show how miserable people are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which. Yeah. That was my first reaction too. Yeah. <laughs> They're in dirt houses. Yes. Why are they having their picture made in front of their dirt house? But it makes sense. We think about it a little bit more. Yeah, so how we're using Butcher's photographs. Yeah. His intent was to show a people pride of place change. Uh -huh. We're using them in modern day history textbooks to say, look how miserable they were. Yeah. yeah. And Butcher's photographs are part of the American Memory Project. Um, and so they're very much accessible today, and the uh, the Historical Society of Nebraska has done a fabulous job of really promoting his because they're really interesting photographs, um, and the bulk of them is what's interesting. It's not like one or two; it's like fifteen hundred of these homestead photographs exist. They're they're really quite spectacular, and you, they'll show up in textbooks, and and they haven't been given credit. They just show up. And the photograph is not talked about. It's just an example of living misery. conditions. And exactly. yes, misery. Yeah. And you know, they were up against some terrible odds. I think they've moved away from agriculture a little bit in that region, you know, more towards um, ranching because of the environment. Yeah. What's the difference between daguerreotype and stereotype? Well, a daguerreotype is that very first process of uh, making a photograph on a metal plate. And the other one is the a stereograph theme. is that that double image that you saw, that you, you saw and they're that. like this, and you would put them in a stereoscope, which is like a little viewing camera, uh -huh. and it would appear to be two-dimensional. I mean, sorry, three-dimensional. Yes. yes. So uh, a stereographic camera had two lenses, like this. That it would well, the, one, the one photograph you showed, he must have been using the same camera because the clouds were different. Well. Clouds were yeah, and well, they Peter Britt, though, the clouds didn't show up. They didn't register on, on collodion photographs. The, the sky would just appear <coughs> as white. So the clouds were added in later. It was kind of photographic <laughs> trickery. I mean, it's an interesting conversation about how documentary these photographs really are, because he did sandwich negatives, and he would just add clouds in. So maybe he thought with different clouds it would appear you know, more ethereal. But you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> From the very beginning, photographers had that conversation that this is not real. This is not what things look like. We're we're inventing through our camera. Really fascinating. Well, and then from what you were saying, it sounds like the model for their invention was already set, even though the technology was yeah. pioneering. So an idea of the picturesque yeah. means that you have to shape what you're going to produce to yep. to conform to a pre-existing idea the, of what counts as picturesque. That's exactly and right. So I'm wondering, like, do you see, can you track changes in the idea of what counted, what people understood to be picturesque as new technology um, uh, starts producing new it's images? It's a pretty solid concept. I mean, that idea was really invented in the 17th century. If you look at paintings by Poussin and, and Claude Lorraine, you're, you're going to see the picturesque being developed in painting. Um, and then they started to write about it. And there were all of these texts, you know, considering the picturesque and what does it mean and how is it different from the beautiful or the sublime. And so it was a very, very strong, very deeply rooted concept. And it, I don't think it changed that much. It, what changed was how photographers like people like Butcher were able to adapt their landscape to that concept and really not the other way around. How big were those, the actual first photographs in the pod that you showed? A full-size daguerreotype, like the biggest that we have, are a full size is about that big. But that was a very expensive photograph to make, because if you screwed up, that was a lot of um, material, a lot of chemistry that had to be thrown away. So they did half-plate daguerreotypes, which were like this, and even quarter-sized daguerreotypes, which were like this. And then they had jewel size as well, these very teeny tiny ones. To access all of our Saturday U lectures and to find out about upcoming Saturday U events in your area, visit uwio.edu slash Saturday U.